to uh, my conversation on working toward liberatory education practices. And so um, in an effort to situate myself in this work, um, I wanna start with what brought me to research centering black girls and women. Um, and so this is a picture of my high school in Scranton, Pennsylvania. I went to Scranton High School, um, but I'll start even further back. Um, I was born in Newark, New Jersey, um, which was a very racially diverse area. Um, head Start and kindergarten, uh, all of the students in my class were black. So I didn't even know I was black. I just thought, like, I, I just knew I was a kid. Um, and I don't remember uh, feeling uh, any different from anyone. But by the time I was six, my family decided to move to Scranton, Pennsylvania. Um, and I remembered that was the first time that I felt othered. Um, and I saw only one, one other black girl in the classroom who ended up being my friend for 20 plus years after that. But um, the teachers were all white in the school, um, in the local school in Scranton, uh, the students were all white. Um, and so that was definitely a cultural shock for me. Um, and it led to um, other things and treatment that I would witness later on regarding discipline and academic achievement. Um, and so, you know, I've been taught that college and education were a pathway to upward mobility um, and that it would be key to escaping poverty. Um, and although my family could not give me much direction on how to go about getting into college, I learned about taking honors and AP classes as an option when I was placed in these courses um, in middle school. Um, I entered in high school and I was in honors geometry and I was in honors English and um, realized that this was the pathway to getting college credits and possibly taking AP classes um, as a junior and senior. Um, as I did enter these classrooms, and I'll say that I uh, kind of, I ended up not taking AP STEM courses. I took AP English and AP US history and AP, uh, what is it, European or world, world history. They called it world history, but they only taught you European history in my world, uh, AP world cultures course, I think. Um, but I didn't take STEM classes um, and I, I felt like it got more difficult and there was less help available. Um, as I moved through, but I noticed that in the honors and AP classes that I was taking that I didn't see um, the same demographics represented um, in the school. Um, so I would see black students and Latina, Latino students at lunch um, in my regular science class, but in AP classes, I was the only black girl um, with the exception of another girl who identified as biracial. Um, so that was the first time I noticed tracking within schools and it's a story that I'm sure many others have experienced as well. Um, so that led me to a little over or about a decade later for my master's, um, I went into a high school. Um, I used the pseudonym uh, Lakeland Spring High School um, and saw many of the same trends um, with the exception of the fact that the school was uh, majority black students. Um, so in 2015 at this school, white students made up 61.9% of students taking at least one AP class, while black students made up only 33.7%. Um, and in the same year, white students made up 64% of students taking AP math classes and 70.3% of students taking AP science classes, while black students made up 29.1% of students taking AP math classes and 21.6% of students taking AP science classes. These figures show that the racial percentage of students in the school, 64.5% black and 31.4% white is not proportional to those represented in AP classes. Um, and so, uh, you know, I decided to focus on black girls in AP and honors classes, and then later um, on academic achievement and black girls more broadly, um, because uh, much of the literature on black girls in education informs audiences of marginalization due to the criminalization of black girls um, you know, like when we think of uh, work by like Monique, uh, Dr. Monique Morris. Um, and while criminalization is of significance, literature and research on achievement is just as necessary. Um, and so I felt the topic of Black girls in AP classes was important due to the ways in which advanced placement has historically increased the likelihood of attending college while simultaneously maintaining racialized and gendered outcomes um, that may be different from those that boys experience. Um, so I do present some examples of things that came out of the interviews that I conducted within this school. Um, I interviewed 24 Black girls um, in a mix of uh, regular track, honors, AP courses um, at this high school. I was able to interview a parent of two of the girls um, 
and some AP teachers, um, because that was kind of the trajectory of my project at that time. Um, and I was working on a limited timeline. Um, so here's a quote from a parent, um, a mother named Tasha, who was a parent of two girls who were attending school in the district. Um, she talks about schools as spaces where discipline occurs rather than liberation. She says, I went to parent-teacher conferences last week and I listened to this litany of people talking about how she's not doing her work and one woman told me all about how she isn't interested in history and I was like, yeah, is any of the history about her? And the woman said, oh yeah, we talk about slaves. And I was like, yeah, can you see how that might be a problem? It's just really hard to deal with some of these things. So I think there's a lot to be said for the messages a child gets about what you think they can't do. And I think that the guy who told me my oldest daughter was gifted was an anomaly. I think that generally the teachers that I've come across in my district are much more likely to tell my children what they can't do. And so in this example, um, you know, this isn't a very liberatory encounter. The curriculum, um, more, more than discipline, this is uh, more focused on the curriculum. Uh, but in the next example, she talks more about uh, discipline. Uh, so teachers have gone as far as telling Tasha, um, you know, asking her daughters how they got their hair like this and other microaggressions that are, um, you know, really shocking in a school where the, uh, proportionally there are more black students than there are white students. Uh, one of Tasha's daughters was even escorted out of the class by a police officer for eating fried chicken in a class where white students were eating cupcakes. Yet the white students were not removed from the classroom. Tasha was called after the incident occurred, but was not informed that an officer had removed her daughter from the room until her daughter informed her of this detail. In response, Tasha scheduled a meeting with the teacher to address this incident, which she felt was racially motivated after speaking with her daughter. Tasha worries that some of the cultural symbols within the school, for example, a Blue Lives Matter flag hanging in the school resource office may send her daughters the wrong messages. And so she said, in there, they have a flag hanging up that is a black and white version of the American flag with a blue line through it. So this flag is from a counter movement called Blue Lives Matter. And the idea was that they weren't going to deal with the Black Lives Matter movement, that instead they were gonna subvert it, make it oppositional. And you know, I think about that. My daughters have to walk by every day and that's the message you get when you go to the, police, to the place where discipline occurs in the school. Those kinds of messages are kind of throughout and I'd really like to examine those kinds of things. And so this was pre-pandemic. I'm not sure if that flag has been removed since, um, but I may go back in for data collection uh, moving forward. Um, but this is a school with a history of brutality against black students. And these types of symbols do not provide students with an environment that is safe for learning. If anything, the lack of care from teachers, cultural symbols, and the microaggressions that Tasha and her daughters are forced to confront daily provide an environment that is hostile to the achievement of black students. Um, so in this example, um, oh, with Elena, I'm sorry, we can't see a PowerPoint. I'm sorry. Oh, you can't see it. Nope. Okay, maybe I should stop it and reshare it. Can you see it now? Are you able to see it now? Sorry, I couldn't get off the mute. You can see it now. I'm so sorry. You can oh, see you it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, hold on one second. Okay, so I think we were right about here. Uh, we're talking, I uh, interviewed a, a girl named Lydia, um, who is a black girl taking advanced placement courses. Um, and she talks about how the school is an environment characterized by discipline, um, or she does not, sorry, um, that's another student. Um, so what I wanna say is that an environment characterized by discipline and an exclusionary curriculum is further compounded by the complete avoidance of race. And so in an interview with Lydia, uh, who's a 16 year old 11th grader, she discusses her teacher's uncomfortability with discussing the topic of race in any capacity. Um, and so, Lydia, I asked Lydia, are race, gender, class, all of those intersecting things that we talked about, are they discussed in your school? She says, no. I asked, or is it incorporated into any of your learning? Lydia responds, nope, people are scared to bring it up, especially teachers. They don't even like calling black people, black people. They're like, oh, him over there, him, like they're so uncomfortable. 
And when I was talking to my teacher, we were talking about the study and he was like, she's studying a particular group of people. I'm like, black girls, it says it right here in the paper. I'm like, what do you mean particular? Why are you speaking like that? Just say it. I'm like, what are you talking about? We're black girls. It's like, I'm not gonna get mad at you because I'm black. Like, what are you talking about? Like, it's really avoided. And so when she's referring to the study, she's talking about my study, um, recruiting black girls um, and, and academic achievement in the school. And so the teacher wouldn't even say who I was looking for in the study um, and the, Lydia pointed this out. And so that was an example of like color uh, evasiveness in the classroom. Uh, through this sample of black girls, not only was it clear that students were not satisfied with the curriculum and hinted uh, to a deficit approach to the teaching of material as it pertained to folks of color, but they communicated the importance of teaching to empower students. Teaching to empower students meant providing accurate accounts of history, utilizing pedagogies that countered color evasiveness as articulated by Lydia in the last slide. Um, Shanti, a 17-year-old senior who immigrated with her family from West Africa as a young child, says that her favorite class at Lakeland Spring is an African-American history course taught by an African-American woman. I asked, I want to ask what your favorite class is currently. Shanti responded, history, African-American history to be specific. What do you like most about that class? Shanti responds, first of all, it's the only class that really teaches us about African-Americans. And it makes me mad that you have to be a senior to be exposed to that but I just love the way the teacher, she teaches, like it's amazing. It is, and the way she explains to us about different people from Africa and African-Americans in general. She goes all around and it's just amazing. Um, she goes on to elaborate on the importance of looking at students holistically and talks about this teacher doing that and, and how this is the first time um, in, uh, during her education at the school that a teacher looks at students holistically uh, while making them see themselves through the, the curriculum in a positive way that's more asset, assets uh, based. The next uh, quote is from Cheyenne, a 17 year old African-American teenager in her senior year, um, who also states that the African-American history class is her favorite. Um, so I asked, what is your favorite class currently and why is this your favorite class? Cheyenne responded, African-American history. It's interesting learning about the culture. I've always liked history because it's just interesting to learn about what happened in the past and everything. The interviewer said, is this your first time taking an African-American history course? And Cheyenne replied, yeah, because it's only for seniors. It's like an elective, but it's not because you're still getting your credits for history. So um, many of the girls who were interviewed communicated, uh, you know, they were all within the same school. So they communicated that this African-American history class taught by this one African-American woman in the school uh, was their favorite class. And it was for all of the, the reasons mentioned so far. The curriculum is inclusive rather than exclusionary. Um, they were seeing them, themselves reflected in the history that they were learning. Um, the teacher wasn't avoidant of uh, topics related to race, class, and gender. Um, and so that was very interesting. And it kind of went beyond uh, what I had initially set out to do and, and looking at academic achievement. Like it's connected deeper to what students are learning um, in their engagement with the material. And so Cheyenne goes on to reflect on the limitations of the curriculum for history classes she has taken prior to the African-American history course. Um, she said, if we do learn about African-American history, it's just the main people, Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks. That's all you learn about, especially during Black History Month. We never learn about the Black Panthers. We just learn about the same two people. Um, and so, you know, other than that course, which a lot of students were um, coming in contact with during their last year of high school, um, you know, this was typical of the experiences. U.S. high school curriculums are characterized by Eurocentrism and learning is not culturally relevant to all students. So in my MA research on black girls in advanced placement courses and academic achievement, many of the girls interviewed like Cheyenne communicated their dissatisfaction with the school curriculum and expressed concerns about the exclusion of multicultural experiences in history. These interviews with black girls led me to seek out these teachers who do utilize liberatory pedagogies to teach students resisting exclusionary curriculums and school districts. And so listening to black girls and their experiences brought me to uh, my focus on black women educators who use liberatory pedagogies. Um, last summer, the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor compounded by the COVID-19 pandemic amplified a national dialogue on anti-racism and paths toward black liberation. 
Central to the pursuit of Black liberation is the fostering of holistic anti-racist education at the pre-collegiate level, um, similar to what one of the girls uh, discussed. Uh, preceding and following these incidents, Black women educators across the United States have continued to function as scholars and activists while also working toward Black liberation. With this and the interviews I had documented with the girls from the Pennsylvania High School a year earlier, I decided to research those Black women educators who were doing this work. Black women's liberatory pedagogies provide an example of critical pedagogy that addresses the invisibility of Black women's knowledge production within schools as institutions. U.S. high school education reinforces inequality um, and K through 12 education generally reinforces inequality through what is taught to students and how that curriculum is taught by its teachers. Black women's liberatory pedagogies work to decolonize the ways in which teaching, learning, and practice are generally accepted in order to create space for new modes of knowledge creation. Unfortunately, much of the empirical research on these pedagogies examines Black women's liberatory pedagogies at the university level, and there is limited literature on Black women teachers using liberatory pedagogies um, in K-12 education. Even further, although Black women teachers have been knowledge producers since their arrival in the Americas um, and before, there is a scarce amount of literature and few documented first-person narratives from these women. And so just before I move forward, um, I wanted to find some concepts um, and I'm definitely I'm in the preliminary stages of data collection uh, for this dissertation portion of my study. Um, but I, you know, pedagogy ordinarily refers to the art and science of teaching and can apply to in instructional analysis, design, development and evaluation of student learning. And uh, I'm defining black liberation as the effort to dismantle systems of structural oppression affecting members of the black diaspora and the imagined in-state thereof. And so I'm hoping to develop a glossary. Um, so I'm defining as I'm going along um, and, and cross-checking uh, cross my data and seeing what educators are coming up with and how they're defining their praxis. So the use of these liberatory pedagogies by Black women represents the intentional decision to center Blackness and liberation, informed by and predicated on their positionality as Black women educators and drawn from a long lineage of Black women in liberation and education. Teaching using these pedagogies represents a viable means to achieving Black liberation as it equips communities with the tools and knowledges to recognize power structures, systemic marginalization, and tools for dismantling these systems. The following is by no means an exhaustive list of characteristics associated with Black women's liberatory pedagogies, but some features from studies at the university level include an emphasis on contributing to community transformation, Black women finding voice to identify and name their race, gender, class, sexual orientation experiences, resisting hegemonic expectations, embracing resistance pedagogy and praxis, and teaching to heal. Black women's liberatory pedagogies interrupt traditional Western and male ways of knowing to embrace Black women's theorizing. And this in turn validates the truth that Black women's lived experiences are worthy of studying. And this truth is based on centuries of a rich intellectual tradition and struggle for liberation. I present uh, three women here uh, to uh, show the historical rootedness of Black women's liberatory pedagogies. When thinking of Black women scholar activists, in the United States, I present Septima Poinsett Clark, Ida B. Wells, and Gwendolyn Patton, focusing on the ways in which these women engaged in liberatory modes of education historically. This uh, list is not exhaustive, it's growing and it moves beyond the United States, uh, but for now, this is where I'm starting. Um, Septima Poinsett Clark um, is an activist educator who implemented her citizenship pedagogy at the Highlander Folk School in 1957, emphasizing the importance of learning about citizenship responsibilities and the capacity of understanding these responsibilities for activism within the community. And listening to Dr. Love a little earlier and, and conversations about citizenship and what is citizenship on stolen land really you know, connects this and, and it makes me think about it deeper. Um, but Clark identified pedagogy as an active communal democratic and dialectical process involving all different types of learners and society as a classroom. Ida B. Wells was born in Mississippi into slavery during the Civil War. She ended up becoming the co-founder of the NAACP and, an anti and she was an anti-lynching activist, journalist, researcher, and leader. Um, she is a, a woman who began her career as a teacher and gained notoriety as a public voice and advocate for Black people during the Jim Crow era. Although Wells was presented for the founding, uh, was present for the founding of the NAACP, um, her name is not mentioned as an official founder. 
Um, and in, in 1895, she published a pamphlet, The Red Record, which was the first statistical record of the history of American lynchings. And so it's, it's always surprising to me as a sociologist that when we're studying classical theory and the canon that they don't bring up Ida B. Wells as doing sociology because she was doing the most dangerous sociology traveling around the South studying lynchings, but we don't, you know, if you take a classical theory course, depending on what university you're at, you might not see her on the syllabus or even re regarded as a sociologist. And then Gwendolyn Patton, um, who had grassroots involvement with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, she was also a theorist of Black power during the 1960s and 70s um, and engaged with Black power philosophy and praxis. She would later work as an English teacher, a curriculum specialist, and an adjunct professor while continuing her activism through the creation of two movements, the National Black Anti-War, Anti-Draft Union, and the National Association of Black Students. This is all to say that scholar activism is nothing new for Black women educators, and serving in this capacity has served as a mode of survival and social transformation for the Black community. Um, and so through my work uh, with Libertor uh, educators thus far. I've connected with the Oakland Community School Project. And so I'm still trying to, uh, you know, I'm going, I'm going to incorporate a piece of the Oakland Community School and the work that the Black Panther Party did um, in creating that school and especially the women educators um, who were responsible for the implementation. Um, I, I'd like to include that in my project as well, but I was able to meet um, former Black Panther Party member Erica Huggins um, and uh, independent scholar, author, and filmmaker, Angela D. LeBlanc Ernest, um, who is the project coordinator and director for the Oakland Community School Project. Um, and so this project is an outgrowth of the years of Black Panther Party research. Um, and they really emphasize curating, creating, and collaborating. Um, and so curating resources and information for researchers and community members alike to learn the history of the Black Panther Party's flagship educational program. Um, is central to the mission. Um, and then they create digital projects and they're working on those currently um, in figuring out ways to archive those digital projects um, and, and to engage with community simultaneously. And then collaborating is the piece, um, which is a hallmark of the Oakland Community School's success. And it is in the same spirit that the OCS project seeks to accomplish its current and future project goals. Um, and so I'm working with them right now, but, um, and they're all the way in Oakland, California, uh, but that's how collaborations are built and made. Um, there, you have, there's opportunity to explore their site a bit more um, and to actually uh, go to this Google form to express interest. And uh, they, wanna, they wanna meet with teachers um, to talk about what teachers need to be liberatory in the classroom. Uh, what kind of resources are teachers looking for? Um, this could be helpful for your students. Uh, so it's just something to think about. And I'll put the link for both of those in the chat when I stop sharing the screen. But um, And here's my information if you want to stay in contact or ask questions or are just interested in this kind of work. And my Twitter handle's there. Um, again, I am seeking participants, uh, Black women educators who use liberatory pedagogies at the K through 12 level. Um, both in traditional, non-traditional settings. Um, and yeah, I'm interested in, in talking to uh, teachers more about the work that they're doing. Um, so that is all I have other than some discussion questions. Um, and if you have any questions, we can either, we can talk about these discussion questions. I'll put them in the chat as well so that I can stop sharing. Um, but we can also just have a more laid back conversation if that's what you all would prefer. So, thank you. Stop sharing. So while Ms. Alana puts her questions into the chat, I guess we'll do them one by one um, as she put them into the chat. Yeah. I'll share those links as well. Um, so yeah, we can either just jump into conversation or if we want to start with 
and I'm not sure, I wasn't sure who the audience would be, if it would be students, um, educators, uh, community members. So maybe you can drop in the chat of uh, what uh, perspective you're coming in from, or you can just unmute yourself and say. Hi, um, I'm Shakoya, and I was so happy to see that you were presenting <laughs> on liberatory practices. Um, I'm a doctoral student at Point Park, and a big focus of mine and a part of my clinical orientation is liberation psychology. Mm -hmm. um, when I first started, I hadn't heard about it. Nobody was talking about it in my program. I just felt like what we were being taught was not what I thought uh, was needed to be talked about. You know, and then that's when I found that. Um, and as I found that, I start finding more Black people who practice, you know, liberation um, philosophies. Um, and it's to me, it's really just amazing work. Like the concept, the idea, um, I think it's just all great. And I think that's what we need. Um, I do get a lot of pushback from typically white males <laughs> when we have these <laughs> conversations about liberation. Um, so I think I'm just so happy to hear you talking about it and like implementing it at the elementary level because my dissertation is about these type of practices at the college level, but I feel like it needs to start before that, you know? So I will be interested to see what comes out of your research and where it goes um, and maybe hopefully utilize that in conjunction with my research later maybe, you know, to show how this needs to expand more than um, in just one area or the other, how it needs to be uh, approached to the total educational system. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. Absolutely. Thanks, Shakoya. We're going to have to connect uh, because it sounds like our work really does overlap, but that's, that kind of was the root of, you know, I realized I was thinking I'm going to graduate school. People are bound to be, I'm first generation college, first generation grad student. And so I didn't necessarily realize what I was getting myself into that certain uh, you know, ways of thinking and framing my work would be challenged by people in my department, uh, you know, typically white men and white women too, um, may not understand why I'm using a black feminist epistemological approach or a liberate, you know, what are liberatory pedagogy? What do you mean by liberatory? You know, and I'm always being questioned at every stop along the way. Um, and so, yeah, I would definitely love to talk to you more about that because I, I think that doing liberatory work something that came to my mind, especially during uh, Dr. Love's keynote. And I wanted to ask, we ran out of time, but how do we do this work as junior scholars and graduate students as we're resisting, um, you know, the credentialing, uh, you know, we, we, we're in these programs because we need them to sign papers and we need them to be on our committees and to speak up for us um, and say our name in a room. Um, and so that, I don't know if that's something that you encounter as well, but um, just thinking about doing this work and those challenges and how do you help your community while at the same time trying to move up this, you know, move within this white space. Absolutely. I'm getting pushed back now because my dissertation um, looks at all of that that's been happening at my school in particular. So I'm getting the talk, so you have to be careful and you know, all of that. So um, yes, let's connect outside yeah. of this. I would love to, I'll uh, drop my info in the uh, chat. Perfect. Hi, um, my name is Sabine. Um, I use them pronouns and um, I'm really excited to be in this space um, with um, you all. Um, and thank you so much for also just having this breakout session. Uh, I work with the Women and Girls Foundation and we work with teens um, as they push for different like systemic changes in Pittsburgh. And right now we've been talking about uh, not just like, uh, like liberation um, curriculum for black students, but also like gender liberatory practices and trying to um, understand what that looks like for, especially like our gender expansive youth and like trying to understand like how to approach um, certain um, advocacy efforts in Pittsburgh um, with, in, in a way that's like gender liberatory and stuff. And so like, yeah, I'm interested in learning more about that. And I saw this session and wanted to be a part of it too. Thanks, Sabine. Yeah, I, that's super interesting too. We'll have to connect as well. But yeah, I think uh, gender liberation and like presenting things in a way that um, it doesn't seem exclusionary um, has been something that 
I, I, I haven't found it challenging, I don't think, but I guess I would, I'm hoping that based on feedback I get from participants, I'll find out if it seems exclusionary the way that it's being presented or if it's um, inclusive, uh, if it's seemingly inclusive, because we know, uh, well, I use like black feminist epistemological approaches to my work, um, but we know that all black feminisms aren't the same or not, you know, they're, they're not acknowledging of black feminisms and the complexity, uh, you know, it's not the old guard anymore. Like it's changed, it's inclusive. Um, and so I'm always trying to, uh, be inclusive in my work. Um, so that's really interesting. Thanks. Hi, my name is Carol Frazier. Um, I'm coming from the old whitehead perspective. And um, one of the things I work with the Jewish Healthcare Foundation, and one of the um, things that we're doing is working with youth on mental health advocacy. And I'm really interested in how you see this liberatory work intersecting with mental health. And, and then the next piece of it would be, how do you incorporate some of those um, activities, languages, skills in everyday interactions with youth? Yeah, that's a really great question, Carol, thanks. Um, I you know, so far, I've, like I said, I'm in the very preliminary stages of data collection, but I think even speaking beyond uh, data collection and just thinking about spaces generally um, and liberation, um, healing is something that comes to mind for me and mental health and, and healing. And I, and I think that a strong component of Black women's liberatory pedagogy is this emphasis on healing. Um, and, and I, you know, I, like within the context of the, the organization that you're at, maybe I don't have a specific um, answer, but I'm thinking of even like the, the COVID-19 pandemic and um, the way students are, you know, entering schools now in some places. And, you know, there's not really much acknowledgement for the fact that these students may have lost a loved one, that they've um, been seeing death on TV, they've been seeing death potentially in hospitals, if they've been hospitalized, if relatives have been hospitalized, and, and thinking about what it means to teach from a liberatory perspective where you care holistically about the students and you care about their healing and their mental health um, versus like, okay, let's kind of pretend that this thing never happened, maybe just watch some movies for a few days in class um, and then move on and start doing work again instead of um, figuring out a way to grapple with the new reality and to um, see that students aren't going to be the same, um, that their lives are changed forever, regardless of, you know, what they've been through or what they've seen. They've sat in front of computers for a year and that has changed them. Um, and so I think that that is like a huge uh, piece of thinking about mental health, healing, Black women's liberatory pedagogies, and, and those are the linkages I see. Um, what was, I'm sorry, what was the second question that you asked? The second uh, part of that was, and, uh, can I respond to the first? Or I guess I, I see that, um, or I'm, I'm wondering if, when you think about empowerment and, and rather than empowering youth, but rather having them access their own power it would seem that to me that that liberatory work fits in there too, that you're helping to lip people to liberate themselves to what's inherently theirs. Yeah. So like agency, student agency. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, that so often um, a lot of people like myself, <laughs> that's why I referenced the old white head is wanting wanting to give power to people. And I think just the opposite of that is, is kind of what we're talking about, is helping people to access their own agency and to understand it's there. Nobody has to give you that. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, so, and to me, that kind of fits in with the mental health too, understanding that you have what you need within you um, and being able to access that is really important. 
And sometimes the systems around us have held people back from accessing that. It's not that it wasn't there, it's the systems that we live within that keep us from doing that. But then the other, the other part, the second part was just an, on a, like on a regular basis when you're interacting with youth, how can you incorporate those concepts within your interactions? Yeah, and so based on the experts that I've talked to and about uh, incorporating, and uh, in, I guess in practice, like seeing that in a general day-to-day -day interaction, um, I think it's a matter of meeting students where they are um, and, you know, not necessarily, you know, this practice of sending students out of the room or um, kind of making them into someone else's problem. A lot of the teachers that identify as using liberatory praxis um, emphasize that they, you know, they, they meet these students where they are. They don't send them away. They don't make them seem like their problem, even if they're having a bad day. Teachers have bad days, you know, they know they'll be very honest with their students like, you know, I just need 15 minutes, but you can come back during my lunch and sit here and talk because I know that this other teacher did this thing and we can talk about it and problem solve. Um, and so in, in my work, I can speak to like my work, but I, you know, I'd say a lot of the teachers that identify as using laboratory pedagogies, um, they kind of serve as um, um, I would say a mentor to their students and they're not just like a, a dictator. A, a dictator might be like a very like <laughs> far off, but they're, you know, they're, they're someone who their students come back to and their students value their insight, even if it's real, because they're not sending them off just because they're going off of the curriculum or they're standing up, you know, like they're standing up in the class because they need to stand up. Like they're not going to get sent out of the room for that. They're going to, they're going to have a conversation about it. Um, and so I think on that level of day-to-day of -day practice and dealing with students, it's meeting them where they are, listening to them as people. Um, so I, I hope that answered that question. But if not, let me know. Yeah, yes, thank you. Thanks, Carol. And then I think we have Ben, if, if you want to introduce yourself, you but if not, that's okay as well. Hey, Benjamin. Okay, so we can uh, either just go through the questions um, or we can, oh, um, okay. uh, we can go through the questions. Um, like what does, liber what does liberation mean to you? Um, and, and like, how do you define it in your own work? Um, maybe we can go around in the same uh, order that we just did, or if not, you can, whoever has something that they want to contribute may contribute that now. Because I think it's a difficult question to grapple with um, because it means something, you know, it can mean something very different depending on, you know, whether you're working in a community organization, a nonprofit, um, if you're working, um, creating your own school or if you're working as a public school teacher um but i'll i'll be quiet for a moment i'll go um from a psychological uh, perspective, when I think about liberation, I think about specifically oppressed and marginalized people and how they have internalized um, systemic and um, otherwise uh, systematic forms of oppression that harm them physically and mentally um, and ways that we can look at those structures and empower them to use what they have to dismantle them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of like what my work focuses on, um, bringing those um, concepts to the surface. I think some of these things are so internalized and passed down to us that we don't even think about them in some of the ways that we might want to investigate and reflect on them. So that's what I try to do with my clients so we can form our own idea of what we believe healing is and, and what is needed in that moment and how they want to um, move with what we've learned to dismantle whatever is hindering them or how they want to work through it. 
Um, so that's kind of what it means to me. Okay. So like that idea of like you you like there's the tools there, and then people are kind of able to use that agency again to figure out the best way to move forward and to address these structural um, op oppressions um, and injustices. Carol, I see you're unmuted, but I wasn't sure if you want it. If you were oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just, I'm just, my mind. <laughs> yeah, I think that it's, um, you know, I think in education, I'll say it like in my work, uh, you know, there's so many different layers to uh, education and, and figuring out what is liberatory and, and to what extent you can be liberatory like within a system that wasn't built for you. Um, and, and being present uh, for, for students who have to be in those spaces regardless right now while there's nothing else, there's no alternative, you know, there's alternative um, you know, we talked about charter schools and now, you know, there's uh, Dr. Love talked a bit about charter schools um, as maybe not so great an option. And then, you know, public schools, there's public school systems, and then there's people who are uh, working to create their own schools. Um, there's homeschooling as an option. And it's like, I think it's, I think it's a difficult, I mean, my job is I collect the data and, um, and I try to make sense of the ideas that people communicate, but I think it's just something that really needs more uh, community conversation and dialogue to come to a solution. Um, because, you know, people are not a monolithic group that can be essentialized um, and people have different needs depending on what regions they live in and, and you know, what their standpoints are. Um, so that's all I have to say about that one, but unless there's any other comments, we can move on to the next question. Okay, um, so what do you need as a, we, we have not really, there's not a huge educator. Maybe we can move to, yeah, how can the community partake in pathways toward liberation? And or how are, how, how are uh, community members already doing this work? That's a really great question. Um, I feel like a part of um, our like goal where I work at right now is um, ensuring that like teens understand that their voices matter as well. And so something that I commonly hear from our teens throughout the year is just like how in school their voices or their experiences aren't necessarily reflected in like the curricula or like in, or like they're not given spaces sometimes to even bring their full selves, especially during this past year when like there's a whole pandemic and also systemic racism and lots of things happening outside of the classroom. And yet like there's still that divide sometimes due to a lot of reasons, you know, like due to um, yeah, like funding or due to like, yeah, like everyone's tired. Everyone's um, has like, yeah, certain standard educational standards they have to like meet and things like that. Um, so I feel like something that a community can like continue to work towards is just like creating those spaces for teens to bring their full selves into the classroom, um, whether that's through like representation in the curricula or even just like having a voice to like express like how things impact them in the world so that it isn't necessarily this like complete disconnect between like what's happening outside and what's happening in the classroom, because like what's happening in the classroom is very much connected to what's happening outside. And so I feel like that's one main way that I'm starting to see schools um, open up to that, like whether it's through like anti-racism, like a curriculum or different things like that. And that's been really cool to see because um, yeah, our teens are getting more of a chance to express like what's impacting them and how they have like thoughts on different things and stuff. Great, great. So those partnerships and collaborations are already happening then in some places. I think that's true in some places they are. I think one of the things community groups can do is, is to make sure you have a, a real youth voice present uh, within your organization um, and to, to have it be a, a, a youth voice and a presence that the group really listens to and not just says, okay, now we have a youth uh, representation, but that we have youth, a real youth, 
almost an advisory or a youth group that is moving forward with us. I, I like that a lot because I think that I'm coming from like a nonprofit background, um, but I guess working in nonprofit organizations and seeing the turnover rate of like youth who work for the organization and like, you know, how many things could be done if, if people, if there was like more incentive for youth to stay or like what kind of things are making youth leave? Um, what makes it difficult for organizations to um, get these people to begin with? Um, but I agree with that, Carol. Thanks for that. And along with that, paying them then. Yeah, paying them, yeah. People have to be paid for their work. Mm -hmm. And then so we can move to um, what tools do spaces like this provide us with? I think just one, one tool is a way to connect with each other who has similar uh, ideas because it's always helpful to know who's around you and um, I think it's probably not just in Pittsburgh, but we, I think in Pittsburgh, we often work uh, on one side of the river or in one community and not another. Um, so it's really helpful to know who's doing the work and how we can connect. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, as much as it's, it would be wonderful to be in person and, and see all of you face to face, maybe have lunch or dinner. <laughs> You know, because usually there's like the lunch and there's the award dinner. Um, I think that being virtual has really made and increased the possibilities uh, for networking um, across like, um, you know, because like it, it, I feel like we're able to like meet again on Zoom and it feels less like, I don't know, less pressure than meeting in person than if we were just sitting watching the award ceremony and everyone would go their own way. Um, so I think the possibilities for connections, collaborations, um, have been have grown uh, since being virtual, uh, but like I said, I, that doesn't mean I want to stay virtual. <laughs> I just think that the possibilities have increased, and especially to network, um, you know, with people outside of Pittsburgh, and to see that we're not in a vacuum. Like this is happening everywhere, okay, and to uh, interact with folks internationally who are, have similar things happening in their communities. Um, I find so much value in being able to be validated in spaces like this, because there are not a lot of people like we already discussed that think about, well, not a lot of people that look like, that don't look like us, that think about these things, and that don't validate these ideas or believe in the legitimacy of them. So I appreciate being able to be in spaces like this and be reaffirmed. Um, I think we all kind of like need that. Um, and I try to make that a part of my self-care routine. Every time the summit happens, I try to be here and be present um, and connect with people. Dr. Kathy and all the women um, and men at uh, Gwen's Girls are amazing and have helped pour, in, pour into me in so many ways that it has allowed me to continue to do this work because it's not easy. So um, I think spaces like this are um, what allow me to keep doing this work. Absolutely. I, I think, and my feelings about the summit are the same. Like, I, like I said, I think I missed maybe the one last year because I was sad about the pandemic. But, you know, I always feel like healing and healed. And I remember my first summit, uh, there was like a yoga meditation session, I think I went to and I, I actually I cried like there because I just felt so loved and heard and validated after you know starting grad school and being in a department where it's like ugh. I was like they don't get it they don't understand me and then being in a space with the folks from Gwen's Girls and um, other scholars and community members um, that want to make a difference and care about community um, it really makes a difference it's not like a typical conference because some conferences are very uncomfortable and <laughs> yeah, not great. So yeah, that was the last question I had. Other One was more applicable to educators um, implementing liberatory pedagogy, but um, you know, if you know 
uh, any K through 12 educators that you think might benefit from reaching out to the Oakland Community School Project, definitely, you know, name drop them. Um, and while well, you can have them reach out to me or not. Um, but yeah, that's, does anyone else have any thoughts or questions or concerns? Get your contact info. If you could put it in the chat, that would be helpful. Thank okay. you. No problem. So thank you, Miss Elena uh, from the BGA for actually doing this fireside chat with us. Um, most certainly thank you for all the people who joined to listen to them to learn more about liberation. Um, like I said, if you want more information, she has put our information in the chat and most certainly I'll see you, you guys have shared yours as well. So I guess I'll see you guys on the other side. Thank you for joining us in this conversation and most certainly there's many more to come. Have a great day. Thanks.